continue. Welcome everybody. Uh, last year in May, we had the first series of the Casalegno lecture with uh, um, Bob Stonecker telling us about conditionals. At the time, we did not know whether we, we could have a second series, and now happily we can. And we hope to turn this into a regularly occurring event. Um, so this year's speaker is Professor Timothy Williamson from University of Oxford. And I bow to the real organizer of this event, Professor Elisa Paganini. Uh, and if you please can introduce Professor Williamson. Yes, I will make a very short presentation. Professor Timothy Williamson is, of course, one of the leading philosophers of our time. He's Wycombe Professor of Logic at New College in Oxford. His main interests are in logic, philosophical logic, epistemology, metaphysics, and philosophy of language. And his research does not only concern these different topics, but it connects them in interesting and insightful ways. In order to present his main research topics, I will briefly consider and uh, present his books. His first book is Identity and Discrimination, where the metaphysical notion of identity is compared to the epistemological notion of uh, discrimination, and it is claimed that identity is the standard of discriminability and discriminability. His second book is the book I know better, it is Vagueness, and in this book he defends the epistemic theory of vagueness, a theory which were not very much defended when the book were published, but which is now, uh, of course, even thanks to the book, one of the leading options. The third book is relevant for the lectures, is the, uh, very relevant for the lecture, is Knowledge and Its Limits. Um, and in this book, it, the main claim is that knowledge is the central notion of epistemology and the norm of assertion and belief. His fourth book is The Philosophy of Philosophy, in which the methodology of philosophy is considered and uh, in which it's claim, it is claimed, contrary to what most philosophers believe, that the methodology of philosophy is not so different from the methodology adopted in other research areas. His fifth book is Modal Logic as Metaphysics, where he claims, uh, um, he argues in favor of necessitism, namely the thesis that it is necessary what there is. This thesis is very much controversial and it is argued for, as usual, with very great ability. And the last published book is Tetralog, a book which is a bit different from the previous book, both in style and for target, it has, it presents a dialogue among four people in a train where it is discussed, the, the, and they discuss the advantages and the disadvantages of absolutism and or versus relativism concerning superstition, science, and morality. Let me just finish saying that uh, I'm really glad that the team accepted to be here for the Casalegno lectures. Paolo Casalegno had a great esteem of you. He would definitely have liked these lectures, and I'm sure that listening to your lectures and discussing philosophy with you will be a way to recalling him. Thank you. Well, uh, thanks very much. And I, th I think it's going to be um, most uh, enjoyable for all of us if, uh, if we conduct these as a series of uh, seminars more than uh, formal uh, lectures. Um, and I mean, so do, do you feel free in, uh, I mean, there will be a kind of lecture half and a discussion half, but uh, during the lecture half, do feel free to ask uh, questions of uh, clarification. 
um, but sort of leave the longer questions and objections uh, till the, the discussion period. Because if you, <laughs> if, you, if you raise them during the middle, we might never get to the, the end of what I'm supposed to be uh, say, saying uh, during the, the day. But, but a, a few questions of clarification will, will definitely uh, help to relieve the boredom. Um, and, and, you know, if I don't see your hand and just, just w w wave your arm as uh, dramatically as, as possible. And, uh, um, yeah, so it's, uh, it's a great honor to be uh, invited to give these lectures uh, in uh, honor of uh, Paolo Casaleño or, or Paul Woodhouse, as I sometimes uh, think of him. <laughs> um, and um, I mean, he was somebody that I that I knew a bit, but but, but not uh, nearly as much as I would have uh, liked. I, and I still sometimes uh, think uh, about questions that that he asked me. Um, and I still re remember how. Um, angry he was with himself when he thought that he'd made a mistake. Um, and much more, <laughs> I mean, these would always have been very, very subtle mistakes and much, I mean, there was no need for anger, but since I would probably have felt anger in the, <laughs> or I do feel anger when I feel I've made a mistake, I completely sympathized uh, with him. And um, I mean, we, we, there was a, a, a conference uh, in, uh, in honor of uh, him shortly after his death here in, in, Milan, in 2011, I think. And uh, so my, my role in, in that was, um, at, at my choice, was, was to uh, reply to uh, talks uh, given by Paul Bogosian and uh, in absentia Crispin Wright. Um, and, and the reason I was doing that was simply because I'd, you know, I, I wasn't really in a mood to um, object to, to anything in Parler's work because I feel too much sympathy with it. And uh, in defending him against Bogosian and, and Wright, uh, I wasn't engaged in any kind of rhetorical or uh, dialectical uh, exercise. I was simply defending him because I thought he was right and they were wrong. Um, so, uh, well, I, I, I just ho hope that these, these lectures will be worthy of him. Uh, what I'm going to be talking about is a kind of bunch of connected uh, issues um, which have to do with, uh, in part, with ways that uh, the work in epistemology has, has been getting connected in, in recent years with uh, work in normative uh, theory, uh, but often not connected in the ways that I really like. And so I th this is an, an attempt to, to redo some of that. Uh, some of it will start from, from things that, that I've, well, I, I don't, I'm not sure that any of them have actually appeared in, in print, but uh, which are available on the internet. But I w I, I'm going to go beyond uh, what's uh, available uh, there. Um, and today I'm, uh, I'm going to focus on the, uh, um, the notion of justification because the, the terms justification or justified, I mean, these are the, 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 the used as the, the sort of central uh, normative terms in contemporary uh, epistemology. Um, and and so, as it were, I mean, that's, that seems a good place to start. And um, maybe with a few of the, the clarifications which are typically made about what's intended by the term justification uh, in epistemology. So um, typically, you'll be told uh, that, that when we're using the term uh, justification in epistemology, we're, we're using it to stand for epistemic justification as opposed to uh, pragmatic uh, justification. Um, and the, I mean, the kinds of examples that are used to um, elucidate the, the difference you know, have to do with things like uh, Pascal's wager, where there's a pr what Pascal provides is a, um, a pragmatic justification for 
uh, believing in the existence of God, but he doesn't provide an epistemic justification. He doesn't provide any evidence for the existence of God. It's just that it might be in your, it's in your interests to, um, or expected interests to believe uh, in God. And uh, as we're for a mon more mundane uh, e example, um, you know, there could be situations where somebody's, let's say, about to um, undergo an operation and um, and the situation is that uh, if they if they believe that the operation will be successful in advance, then uh, it has a forty percent chance of success. Whereas if they uh, don't believe that it will be successful, then it only has a twenty percent chance of success. Um, and uh, so, in a case like that, there's a pragmatic justification for them to believe that the operation. Uh, will be successful, even though, um, e even given that they believe that it will be successful, the evidence is still that it probably uh, won't be. Um, and so those, th those are cases of pragmatic justification, but which, in some sense, they're not directed at the truth, or if it, perhaps it would be better to say that, that they don't work by providing any uh, evidence. And so um, those kinds of justification are, are, are being put to, to one side. Um, and for a related reason, although this, this point is less often made clear, but it has been made by various people, um, it's, it's not really relevant to these debates to, to think of uh, justi justification uh, in terms of some kind of consequentialist uh, criterion. I mean, you might think, well, okay, the, the reason that, that these other cases are pragmatic justification and not epistemic justification is that they, they concern um, you know, non-epistemic values such as you know, health or you know, not going to hell or whatever it is. Um, whereas you, know, you might think, well, suppose, suppose that we, we thought of justification in a consequentialist way, but, but made the... the the value who, who's, uh, the expectation of which we were trying to maximize, if we made that something epistemic or something relevant to um, the epistemic, such as knowledge or truth, then might not we get a, a, a consequentialist standard of, for epistemic justification? But in fact, if you think about a lot of the examples of um, pragmatic justification, you, you see that they can very easily be adapted to, to, to any kind of consequentialist uh, standard of a more epistemic kind. Because you know, or, or if you take the case of the operation where there's a pragmatic reason for believing that it will be successful, even though it's against the evidence. I mean, suppose that we add to the uh, example that the person uh, who's uh, about to undergo the operation um, is uh, in the early stages of some a tremendous um, scientific research program, and it's only if they, the, the operation is successful that they'll be able to continue with this research program. And so, as we were on, on consequentialist grounds, even if you make the value be truth or knowledge, it, uh, it seems that, that it makes sense for them to, uh, to believe that the operation will, will be successful. But, but that just isn't the kind of justification that, w generally speaking, people are concerned uh, within this uh, debate. Um, so th there's that kind of clarification uh, which is uh, typically made. Um, and you know, it, it, we're, dealing with some, that we're dealing with some kind of epistemic norm, uh, maybe a norm that we can perhaps articulate using a word like ought, although obviously not in a specifically uh, moral uh, sense. And then there'll be some, there are some further clarifications which are also uh, typically made so that um, there's a distinction between um, propositional um, justification, sometimes called ex ante uh, justification, and doxastic uh, justification, sometimes called ex post um, justification, where uh, the difference um, is that the, the propositional justification re really just uh, has to do with um, evidence for the given proposition, so that you're, as it were, in, in, in 
a good epistemic uh, position to believe it. But I mean, there could be this propositional justification, even if, as a matter of fact, you don't believe it. And a doxastic justification, uh, which has to do with the way in which someone actually does believe the given proposition. And um, I mean, even if there's propositional justification uh, for, you know, for believing something, I mean, even if you've got lots of evidence for it, uh, you might lack doxastic justification um, because uh, you, you ignore the good evidence that you have for the proposition and, and believe it for some other completely stupid uh, reason. So, so those are the kind of uh, clarifications which uh, tend to be uh, made of the notion of, of justification as it's used in epistemology. And uh, w one thing that is pretty clear, given all this clarifications, which is that what we're talking about uh, is a technical term of epistemology. I mean, there's nothing wrong with epistemology having technical terms, but, but this is one of them. Um, and, and so it's already just slightly odd that, that a lot of epistemologists um, talk about um, what's sort of intuitive, as they might put it, or um, pre-theoretically um, clear about justification. Um, even though you might think that since this is a technical term, we, we should be pretty cautious about just uh, jumping uh, <laughs> ahead and making all sorts of um, pre-theoretic uh, judgments about this rather uh, technical uh, notion. Um, and one, one particular kind of uh, thing that you get people saying, and which is often given as a kind of clarification to explain what the, the notion of justification um, is, is that um, people will say, well, look, if you have the, I mean, let's just take the standard uh, epistemological contrast between the, the good case and the, um, the bad case, where... Um, the good case is just something where everything is normal and you're, you're getting lots of knowledge about the external environment and so on. And then the corresponding bad case is a, a skeptical scenario where you're a brain in the vat being manipulated so it seems to you exactly as though you were in the good case. And then one thing that a lot of epistemologists, well, they, I think they take themselves to be more or less stipulating, but, uh, but uh, perhaps maybe taking it as obvious, is that, um, I mean, because, these, because of the relation between the two cases, uh, you'll, you're supposed, it's supposed to be the case uh, that you believe a proposition in one of these cases, if and only if you believe it in the other. We better put aside any kind of concerns about externalism, about content for, for these purposes. Um, and um, a claim that is made is that, that you're you're justified in believing P to exactly the same extent that you're in the good case and in the bad case. So that, that as well, there's supposed to be no difference in justification between your belief in P between the two uh, cases. And, and this has all sorts of um, implications. In particular, um, There'll be all sorts of things that you know in the good case. For example, in the good case, you know that you have hands. Um, and, and so if you know, I, as almost, almost everybody agrees, that th th then you're, you have a, a justified belief, a doxastically justified belief. And uh, since you have it in the, in the good case, uh, you, you also have it in the bad case. So in the bad case, you're, all, you're equally justified in believing that you have uh, hands, even though it's false that you have hands because you're a brain in, in, in a vat. Um, and, and so one sort of more, or, or almost immediate consequence of this way of setting things uh, up um, is that uh, there can be justification for false beliefs. Um, and that's taken as almost uh, obvious um, by... Uh, um, a lot of epistemologists. W one thing that's a little bit suspect about this is that you know, a number of things are, are being all kind of 
um, put onto the table as if they were all part of uh, the, just the explanation of what it is that we mean by justified, or more or less that. Um, but then when you, when you think about um, what the different things that are being put on the table are, you realize that these can't just be um, some kind of explication of what's meant by the term justified, because they have various consequences um, that don't even involve the word justified. For example, you know, on the one hand, justification is being treated as a central uh, norm of epistemology, uh, and on the other hand, it's being treated as something that's uh, equal in the good and bad cases. And so one implication of this way of introducing the notion is that the, the good and bad cases are the same with respect to the central norm of epistemology. And that's a very, very non-trivial uh, consequence. So, I, as we were in, in logicians' terminology, this, the, the, um, this kind of introductory theory of justification is a non-conservative extension of what we had uh, before, because it's, it's in effect giving us what we might call various uh, internalist uh, consequences. Um, and so that's, that's a reason for, for going back and, and thinking these things through a bit more uh, carefully. Um, and the, the sort of strategy that I want to uh, adopt is, is to, to develop a, uh, on independent grounds a, a framework for thinking about the relevant kind of uh, normative notions, um, which we can test in relation to examples where the, the content of the norms uh, is relatively clear. And then once we've got a, a working framework of that kind, uh, we can uh, think about how to apply it in the case of uh, epistemology. Um, and, you know, I think in the long run, um, this, this is something that ought to help in what you might think of as the reunification of different strands of uh, thinking about notions like justification. Because after all, uh, we don't just talk about justified belief, we also talk about justified action. Um, although pre you might think, well, if it's justified action, surely that isn't just epistemic. Uh, and um, if, if we can have some kind of unified framework that isn't just specific to the epistemological case, then, then that is likely to be uh, a better setting uh, in which to, uh, to put together these um, norms of different things like belief and action. Um, so what, what I'll do now is just briefly um, expand um, a kind of framework that I developed in some uh, previous uh, work. And, uh, and then I want to, to talk about it uh, in relation to a, a critique uh, of, of that line of argument of mine um, in, a, in a recent paper by Simeon, Kelp, and Giesen, Norms of Belief, which I think some of you have been uh, reading. So I thought it, it would be interesting to, uh, to confront a few of the things that they uh, say. Um, so the, the, one of the things that I, I want to do uh, is to apply the standard distinction between justifications and excuses um, to the epistemological case and, and to argue that we may have been misclassifying a lot of cases as justification when really they only count as excuses. Now, of course, the, 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 this distinction it was, um, I guess, introduced you know, as a, a, a significant theme um, in philosophy by J. L. Austin in his paper, A Plea for uh, Excuses. Um, and the, the, the majority of the literature on it has, has come in the area of philosophy of 
uh, law. And, uh, um, and certainly, the, there are a lot of relevant considerations there, and, I, and I'll use some analogies with, with uh, law in, uh, in giving these examples. But uh, one reason why I, I didn't find most of the literature on the distinction as helpful as I hoped was that it's, um, it's very much uh, focused on um, issues like the responsibility of agents and so on. And I, I, I don't think that that's a, a terribly useful focus when we're talking about epistemological matters. Um, I mean, partly for the very simple uh, reason that um, it's not only uh, human beings who who have uh, knowledge. Uh, it's also, uh, I take it, um, lots and lots of uh, non non human animals, cats, dogs, and and rats, and and probably quite a, a, a lot further down the um, the, <laughs> the chain. Um, they all have um, they have knowledge, and. And, there's, and, and quite a lot of the relevant considerations about brains in vats would apply just as much to, um, to cats and dogs' brains in vats as to human brains uh, in vats. Um, but as we're, it, it's, it's somewhat you know, inappropriate to be thinking about um, the epistemological status of cats and dogs' beliefs uh, in terms of something like the responsibility of an agent. And uh, so I'll say some more things in relation to that. And, but it, it seems to me, e even in the case of human beings, um, given the, the very, very large extent uh, to which uh, belief is, uh, is not a voluntary matter, it's also uh, not terribly useful to be uh, um, talking about uh, an agent's responsibility uh, for their beliefs. I mean, of course, you can you can talk about an agent's responsibility for how they conduct inquiry and things of that kind, um, but but a, an awful lot of what is going on in these examples, and this would include the skeptical scenarios, which are one of the main focuses of uh, debate here, um, it has to do with perceptual knowledge and perceptual belief, um, which are. Um, I mean, there might be some t little voluntary element in it, but, the, but they're mostly involuntary. They mostly don't have, really have to do with uh, uh, agents' uh, responsibility. But, and of course, you might think, well, isn't the notion of an excuse uh, uh, geared to those kind of questions of responsibility? I mean, and to some extent it, it is, but I think it's, it's useful because um, it's a, an independent reminder of... Um, how, how rich the space of um, different kinds of normative status uh, is. Um, so that uh, as we, if we try to, uh, to classify everything in terms of you know, some kind of binary distinction between justified and unjustified, that's an extremely crude way of uh, thinking of the subject matter. And uh, and it's likely to lead to all kinds of theoretical uh, distortions. But I mean, the picture I, I, I want to have is that, that we start off with some kind of uh, primary norm, whatever it is. And as I said, this is meant to be a, 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 an account that works for um, all sorts of cases outside epistemology as well. Uh, and that Justification is really just a matter of complying with that primary norm. Um, but then there are, as it were, if you like, second-rate second positive uh, statuses or somewhat positive statuses that we can have, but which are mainly to be understood in, uh, in relation to the... Uh, the the primary norm. And so that's where I have this apparatus of uh, a secondary norm, wh which consists in having a disposition 
to comply with the primary norm. Um, and a tertiary norm, which consists in um, doing what someone who, com who has such a disposition would do. Um, and then there's a, a, a fourth kind of norm, w which sort of combines the, the secondary and uh, tertiary norms, which uh, I, I just mentioned very briefly uh, in the paper on justifications, excuses, and skeptical uh, scenarios. And I didn't make very much of it, but, uh, but as you'll, you'll hear in a bit, I think it's actually crucial to understanding uh, some of the uh, examples. Um, and so the, the idea is that um, the, in cases where you violate the, the, the primary norm, you don't count as justified, but, but there can be, you can have a very, very good excuse. I mean, excuses, of course, tend, typically come in degrees, but, um, but you can have an excellent excuse, even though you're not justified. Um, and and the, what we, want, we need to do is to explore the, the, the realm of uh, different kinds of excuses in epistemology. I mean, th there are, I'm, I'm not, remotely suggesting that what I'm offering you is an exhaustive taxonomy of excuses. I mean, there are a whole lot of excuses that, um, that are of different kinds from the ones that I'm talking about. So, I mean, for example, it can be an excuse for someone that, um, you know, that they'd, um, that they made some kind of mistake because you know, the, someone they loved had just died or something. And, and you know, I mean, they, so they were so upset. And there were kind of the excuses like, uh, like that, um, which may be somewhat different from the ones that were going to be discussed. I mean, they might in some way be related to this uh, framework. But uh, I mean, I think, you know, one, one thing that you realize if you th think about the the kinds of excuses that um, people can come up with that is that you would not expect to be able to give a complete and um, totally revealing uh, taxonomy of different types of excuses because there are always new ways in uh, new complications that are normatively relevant that can come up. Um, anyway, so want to say something about the application of, of this framework. So I think, uh, w well, in, in the original paper, I, I talked in more detail about the particular case of uh, keeping your promises, and uh, which, a case which I like um, because it's pretty explicit what the, the content of the norm of promise keeping is, because it's just, uh, I mean, the, the, in a, any given case, it's given by the content of the promise uh, itself, but I, another good case um, is uh, the case of uh, law, and it helps for these purposes to think about the case of law in a fairly primitive uh, way. Because, of course, in real life cases, there's, there's a whole there's a whole realm of uh, rules about judicial interpretation and so on, which complicates the the picture. But I mean, just just think of the laws as being edicts you know, um, given by some absolute power and uh, um, which are just quite straightforward. They're things like, you know, like, um, you know, it's, f it's forbidden on pain of death to, uh, to walk on the grass outside or something like that. Um, and so, so complying with that law is just a matter of not walking on the grass. That's, that's all it is. Um, and, but then there's going to be um, a, um, a norm of, a, a secondary norm that, that in some way comes from the primary one um, of uh, having a disposition to, um, to obey the law, which uh, in English is expressed by talking about a law-abiding person. Um, and, uh, you know, and often uh, in, in mitigation, you, you'll have um, you'll have witnesses who are not denying that the that 
uh, the accused uh, break the law, but who are just saying that the, that the accused is, um, is a law-abiding person. In other words, they have the, the general disposition, and then, and then there may be some specific reason why uh, they, they did things differently. I mean, why they, despite having a disposition to obey the law, they broke it on a particular occasion. And, you know, I mean, the kind of, the kind of reason... Um, you know, it might be that that you didn't know that there was a law uh, um, uh, against walking on the grass, although that would suddenly won't get you uh, get you off completely. But it might help. Um, I mean, not to mitigate the uh, the punishment, and you know, or it might be that um, that you didn't realize where you were. You thought you you, you knew the, the, that that. Uh, there was some grass that you weren't supposed to be, to walk on, but you didn't you didn't realise that this was the sacred uh, grass and and so on. And um, and then there's a, there's a tertiary uh, norm as were to do what a, a law abiding person would do on a particular occasion, because the the um, being law abiding um, is. That's a general dispositional characteristic, but but the the tertiary norm, like the the primary one, it has to do w with classification of individual acts as opposed to the, as were, a, the person with their general uh, dispositions, and um, and then there's a a further norm, the one that I as I didn't make so much of in the paper, which was. To, that you, to do what a law-abiding person would do because you are a law-abiding person. Um, and all of, all of these norms, they are subtly different. They're, I mean, they, they, um, you know, there are cases where you, you, you satisfy one of these norms and, um, and don't satisfy uh, another. And, and all of these seem to be in some way relevant to... Um, what attitude we take uh, to uh, to someone who who violates the original norm, um, but but nevertheless satisfies um, one of these uh, other ones, um, as, as we're in some way just how bad we think that uh, is. And yes. Um, let me, yeah. Yes. Well, but not necessarily because you have a disposition to do it. So, so that, um, you know, it, it, for example, there could be a case in, in which, um, let's say there are, there are two, so, some, somebody knows um, that that your suitcase, that your, 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 your bag is full of money, and they have a similar bag which is not, not full of money, and, they, and so they want to do um, a, uh, a, a swap. Um, and, um, and there's some kind of mix-up, and so they, so they end up just taking their own bag after all, so they, so they fail to take uh, your bag. So they've, they've complied with the law against theft. Um, but let's suppose, but it could be um, that it, they're in a situation where what a law-abiding person would do, because of the mix-up, would be to take the bag that wasn't theirs. Sorry, so, so for, there was a main understanding. The primary norm is not intended to comply with the norm, it's just comply with It's the just comply with the norm. Because in that case, I wouldn't say that they comply yeah. with the norm of not. Yeah, but... They, Th th these are all focused on success, right? I mean, they, 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 so, I mean, you know, w w whether you... So l just take the case with, uh, you know, a, a norm of not walking on the grass. 
I'm assuming that that no means exactly what it says, which is, um, and so that you comply with it if you don't walk on the, uh, the grass. And if you walk on, on the grass, um, you, then you automatically violate the norm. And um, it's not a norm about what your intentions are. It's just a norm about what you do. Um, and of course, I mean, that's, the, although some laws take intentions into account, I mean, it's still, you know, it isn't just a matter of intention. I mean, you, you don't, you can't commit a murder just by intending <laughs> to, right? Uh, um, so, so compliance does not mean intending to comply. It just means actually doing whatever is re required. And what, it, what is required is just given by the content of the norm. And, and so I, I'm one thing that the case of law brings out is just that, that y you can, in principle, you can have laws about, about, also, about pretty much anything. I mean, of course, you know, the, the, there, are, there are some laws that are not easy to enforce. I mean, a law against um, you know, having um, you know mental uh, a mental image of a of a red square would would be hard to enforce. But but maybe with improvements in brain scanning, what, you know, one day laws like that can. <laughs> yep, at least. Uh, um. It doesn't, it doesn't I mean, it, having an intention might be one way of being disposed, but it doesn't require that because, um, you know, in, if you think about the epistemological case, um, you know, people sometimes talk about, you know, uh, there being a general intention that one's belief should be true or so, or and so on. But if, you know, if intentions are uh, things that, that, we're actually supposed to formulate, then it's, it doesn't seem that most people have an intention that their beliefs be true. I mean, they, they, they may well be disposed uh, to, to have true beliefs. I mean, just supposing for the sake of argument that, that the norm is truth. Um, but, I mean, you know, if you, I mean, take a fanatical um, football fan. I mean, they, you know, they, they may be extremely accurate and scrupulous in their beliefs about football scores and so on. But it, it, it doesn't have to be because they have a general intention to be accurate. They just, the, you know, the, 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 it's just all focused on the, on the as it were, the first order things. Um, and, you know, and even more so with young children and, and non-human animals and so on. So, so uh, it, it just is, it's, this is meant to be a disposition in, you know, in the ordinary sense of dispositions, um, where, I mean, we can, you know, so, I mean, somebody can, um, for example, somebody might have a, a disposition to get bad tempered in hot weather. And it's not because they have an intention to get bad tempered in hot weather. It's just that they're, as it were, they're so built that they, they are in fact disposed that way. Um, and I, I mean, of course, you know, it, I, we could also, you know, go, you know, go into um, the issues of intention. I mean, not, you know, it's the, the fact that I haven't built them in here doesn't mean that, that, that they're just uh, irrelevant. Um, and, you know, but, it, but I mean, I think the intentions, the intentions would, um, would give very different uh, effects. I mean, for example, um, you know, let's say some, somebody who belongs to, you know, some, some crazy fundamentalist uh, Christian sect might, I mean, they might have a very firm intention only to believe the truth. Um, but but they might have totally crazy ways of um, of car you know trying to carry out this intention, and so they so they might have no you know the, no disposition to <laughs> in the relevant matters to to uh, to believe the uh, the truth, even though they have an intention. And you know, and other people might be the other way around. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. Yes. 
Yeah, I, I think I definitely. I, I mean, I think that. I mean, it might be that you're very well disposed, or or just that that you're. I mean, I mean, take a, a cowardly revolutionary, you know, who has a, you know, they have a a, a strong intention to uh, to break the law on all possible occasions, but they're so scared <laughs> that, that, as a matter of fact, they um, you know they, they, they never do break the law, and, and they're never likely to, and you know they just they could never they can't quite get themselves to do it when it comes to it. So so I think I think it. it yeah, there's a sort of two-way independence of intention and, and disposition. I have another question, which is concerned with Isaac Noor. Uh, because the way you define Isaac Noor at the beginning is complies with OGM because you comply with N, which means... Oh, yes. I think... It seems that uh, when... You no, that... Uh, it becomes because of the L and not... Yes. Uh, so uh, the, 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 sorry, that's just a misprint. It should be comply with ODN because you comply with DN. But, um, because um, the, I mean, the two three is meant to be you know two secondary tertiary. So so yes, it it has to be uh, it has to, it's basically comply with the tertiary norm because you comply with the secondary norm. So that's that was just, yes, well spotted. That that was just that was simply a. a Mistake in my typing. Um, um, yeah. When you use the term tradition in this case, um, do you refer to some historic tradition about the current one? The term tradition in the sense of the respective the corresponding parts to involve? Well, so it's, it, I mean, I'm I'm using it without any special assumption about um, uh, about what's required of a disposition. But um, I mean, uh, but my view is that that there is a tendency for us to think of dispositions as um, having some kind of internal basis, um, and and uh, and. In a way that, that I'm use, using that to explain the appeal of sort of internalist claims, such as that justification is equal between the good and bad cases, because the, because it might well be that the, the I mean I think the picture that that people have of these cases, whether or not it would be easy for this to be correct, is is that the the brain in a vat has exactly the same dispositions as it had before it was put in the in the vat. That, 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 as a word, the, because the dispositions have to do, you know, the picture is that the dispositions have to do with sort of I, I, the internal structure of the, the brain, and, uh, and so they're preserved when, when you lift the brain out of the skull and put it in the uh, vat. Of course, I mean, th th there are examples of um, dispositions which are, are, are not um, purely internal. So, that for, for example, um, you know, with the introduction of gunpowder to Europe, then castles became more vulner vulnerable than they had been. So, uh, so they, as it were, in that sense, I mean, vulnerability is, is a disposition. So they were, th their dispositions changed, even though nothing intrinsic in the castles changed. What changed was the availability of, you know, of cannon that, that could smash down the walls. But um, the, um, but I think. The, 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 as a, there's, a, as it were, a kind of pull towards the internal in uh, thinking about dispositions, and I, and I think that has uh, significant repercussions in in epistemology. Um, so, I, but I'm trying trying not. I mean, I haven't said anything yet that that's presupposing anything. Yes. Yes. Which is uh, internalized, but in a way not only an internal attitude, which makes me comfortable with such a way of behaving. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think the, the question of whether you're comfortable with it um, 
is is di is different from whether you have a disposition. Like so that, um, for example. Um, Well, here's, here's, here's an example. I, um, this, I can't resist telling an anecdote. There's a, there was, a, there was a, some Oxford uh, Don who was famous for, this is a long time ago, she was, she, she was, she was very mean, um, but um, mean in the sense that you know, she, she didn't like spending and so on. But, um, but she, she knew that she was mean and um, and so she struggled ag against her meanness. And th there was a, an occasion at, um, at some garden party where she was handing around strawberries and, and she said, um, take plenty, take two. <laughs> and, um, but, but the thing is, she, so she was not at all comfortable with her meanness, but nevertheless, she, she had a, a, the disposition of meanness. So maybe that, maybe, does that, maybe that wouldn't count as a habitus in that case. It was just that you were mentioning it as as a yeah as a, a, a great yes yeah so so I mean I of course in English we have the word habit and you know and habits habits are close to dispositions um, but but they're not the same thing I mean f so for example you know something which is fragile it has it has a it's a disposition to break, but that doesn't mean that it has a habit of breaking. I mean, because it might be fragile and yet never get uh, broken. Um, so, but I, so, but so, I mean, I think there are a kind of range of, um, of, of notions here, which are kind of in, in the similar territory, but w w with subtle variations b between them. Um, and well, I've I've gone I've gone for dispositions, but it, but it could be interesting to think about how how things would go differently if one tried you know some variations on the the, the theme. I mean, I'm not um, you know I, I don't have an argument that, that that dispositions are by far the best <laughs> thing here, but it's you know it's. That, but I, I mean, one reason I'm um, I'm using them is because there's a, a fair amount of literature within analytic philosophy on the metaphysics of dispositions, which uh, has all been developed completely independently of these epistemological issues. And so, as it were, it, it, it's a it, it's a notion that we have some kind of control over that, that that's independent of the epistemology. So that, and. You know, I, I think it's quite uh, useful to, to um, then to bring it to bear on these epistemological questions. Does anybody else have questions of clarification? Uh, um, okay, so I th I think the best the, the best thing is if I if I go on a b now and and say something about. Um, the, the second the second half and but I, I I'll try to keep it relatively uh, short um, so i I think that there's a lot of confusion in the literature in epistemology because people have not been keeping these different um, norms uh, separate and uh, and one notion that I think is particularly subject to this is the notion of rationality. Um, and in fact, the, I mean, some epistemologists w would accept rational as a, a gloss on justified. I mean, Stuart Cohen, for example, so that, that, that he, I mean, he would say that what he means by a, a justified belief is pretty much just a rational belief. Um, and in the case of rationality, one thing that's very notable is that, I mean, we have some kind of standard of a rational belief that just has to do with the relation of the belief to your evidence. Um, that, as it were, that one which, <laughs> a rational belief is something which, roughly speaking, is based on appropriate evidence. But we also talk about um, 
people as uh, rational or irrational. Um, and, uh, and I think that often the, the, the classification of people uh, is brought back into the classification of beliefs, so that, that um, the kind of thing that people are thinking about uh, when they ask whether a belief is rational, they may, they may be directly thinking about the question of evidence, but they may also be thinking, what would a rational person believe in these circumstances? Um, and, um, and that may be very uh, influential in people's thinking about skeptical scenarios. I mean, you know, they're, they're kind of thinking, well, take the most rational person that you know, well, what are they going to believe if their brain is put in a vat? And, um, and so that, that and, and then presumably they will, of course, I mean, the, the, they will be deceived like anyone else in the vat. And so, so it's immediately assumed that that, um, that, that makes the, the belief that you have hands in a vat a, a rational uh, belief, which is a different question from whether it's, it, it satisfies the original criterion, which had to do with its relation to evidence. Um, and, you know, I mean, one view uh, that I, I want to uh, defend, although I'm not going to say much about it today, um, is, is that it, one of the bad things in a skeptical scenario is that you have much less evidence than you think you have, um, and you're not in a position to know that you have much less evidence than you, you, you think you have. And so that the things which you, you, you may think you have adequate evidence for, you may not have adequate uh, evidence for. And, and so, so that, th that would be a way in which beliefs may satisfy w w the, the criterion of um, being what a rational person would believe in the circumstances without, in fact, satisfying the criterion of um, being you know, a rational belief in the sense of one that actually does correspond to the evidence. But a rational person themselves is someone, you know, roughly speaking, in the, well, in this uh, context, is someone who, who tends, to, you know, who has the disposition to, to, um, to base their beliefs on appropriate evidence. So th that if you think about it th th there, there's the, the way that we talk about rationality is mixing up these, these different levels of primary, secondary, and, and tertiary. Um, and um, I mean, it's, it, it's fine for people to argue for specific connections between them in particular cases. But what's not fine is just for all, all of these uh, things to be kind of smuggled in through uh, a confused practice of using these uh, terms. Um, OK, so, so now I, I briefly want to say a few things about this paper by uh, Simeon and others. Um, so their main point, or one of their main points against my view um, has to do with the contrast between the two cases, um, the, the brain in a vat uh, case, which was just, I mean, their brain in a vat is called Ned, but uh, I mean, it's basically just the, the standard scenario. And the case of uh, brainwashed uh, cognizer, this, I mean, I've, I've put these on the, the second page of the handout. And the, the brainwashed cognizer case is, is this. Um, Unfortunate Brianna has recently been brainwashed into taking a red sky in the evening as an indication that something bad will happen to her soon. Just now, Brianna has noticed that the evening sky is red and has formed the corresponding belief about her near future. And their verdict on this case is that Brianna's belief that something bad will happen to her soon is not justified. Whereas they want to say that in uh, the, the standard skeptical scenario, the brain in a vat's uh, beliefs uh, are justified, even, even when they're uh, false. And, uh, and, and what their um, doing with this case is arguing that I can't make the, the, the relevant normative distinctions because my, my apparatus, as it were, doesn't have uh, enough in it to distinguish the two cases, uh, whereas they think it should be clear that um, that Ned is is in a better position than Brianna. Um, so, 
so it, it's not that they're, for this argument, they don't need to positively insist that uh, the brain in a vat has justified beliefs. What's important for them is that there's a, a, a significant normative difference between the two cases. And so if, if the apparatus that I've got just can't make that normative distinction, then there's, there's something inadequate about it. Um, and I mean, the, re the reason that they're, they're saying this is because um, the, I mean, the, the kind of um, description that I give in terms of the, the primary, secondary, and tertiary norms seems to be the, the same of the two cases. Because uh, in both cases, uh, if, if we assume, well, in fact, it, it, it wouldn't matter exactly what, but, but if we assume a truth that the primary norm uh, is one of truth or knowledge or whatever, then, then uh, the, the primary norm is, is violated according to me. But in, in both cases, um, the secondary and tertiary norms are complied with because both, both Ned, the brain in a vat, and Brianna, the brainwashed cognizer, they're meant to be rational people um, who, who are just in unfortunate uh, circumstances. Um, and, you know, and so I, I think the picture is that, that the brainwashing is, is just something that is done to you that uh, will be effective um, no matter, I mean, you can't sort of fight against it or anything. It's it, that it will be, uh, it, it can be just as um, definitive in its effects with with rational people as uh, with irrational ones. And so Brianna is meant to be somebody who's gen, you know, who has a general disposition to be rational, but she was just had the bad luck to be brainwashed in this uh, way. And and so the the, the idea is well, the, Ned and Brianna, they're just just going to end up in the um, in the same normative uh, position as, as each other, but uh, of violating the primary norm, but complying with the secondary and uh, tertiary uh, norms. Um, and this, so, I mean, she, the idea is Brianna's. She has the, she has the right sort of disposition, and um, she's doing. I mean, in informing this silly belief ab about the uh, about something bad being about to happen because of the red sky, um, she's doing what a, any rational person would do in her circumstances. Because any rational person would have been victim of the brainwashing; they, their rationality would not have protected them against the brainwashing. Um, but. I think if you if you think about the hybrid norm, you see that there is a difference that one can make here because um, in in the case of Ned, he's doing what a a person with good cognitive dispositions would do in the circumstances. I mean, the, the circumstances of having been put uh, in, a, in a, having had your brain put in a vat. Um, but although we're assuming that Brianna does have generally good cognitive dispositions, even despite this one bit of brainwashing that's gone on, it's meant to be a very local bit of brainwashing, I think. Um, she has good cognitive dispositions. And um, she's also doing what somebody with good cognitive dispositions would do in the circumstances, uh, because they would all be subject to the brainwashing. But she's not doing it because she has good cognitive dispositions. She's doing it just because she's been brainwashed. So that actually w w she's not complying with the, the hybrid norm, because uh, uh, you know, although she complies with both the secondary and the tertiary norms, She's not complying with the tertiary norm because uh, she's complying with the, uh, the secondary norm. The, I mean, the effect of the brainwashing is completely independent of whether she has good cognitive dispositions. 
I mean, they, as it were, if you think in terms of, a, of the picture of a brain, of a, of a belief box, then the, the brainwasher has just written in this belief into the brainwash, into a, a belief box, and there's nothing she can uh, do about it. Um, so, so I think, in fact, uh, the, the apparatus that I developed in that paper does have enough resources to make the the distinction that um, that the authors of this paper are challenging me to uh, to make. Um, yes. Yeah. So these do what a knower would do, for example, uh, act as if something bad is happening tomorrow because there is a red sky. Because you are a knower, which is the second norm, that is because you are disposed to believe something only if you know it. Now, here, Brianna uh, has somehow false evidence given by the brainwashing. And so she fails to meet the first norm because she believes something even in which she doesn't know. But I don't see how the brainwashing affects the second element and therefore how it affects the hybrid. I mean, it seems to well, me that the, the brainwashing has an effect on the evidence for the particular belief that you happen to believe, that you happen to believe, but not on the fact that you act upon that belief. Yes, but but what we're assessing here is just the the belief itself. So that I mean, so that they the, for them the crucial thing is that her belief that something bad will happen to her soon is not justified. Oh, and um, So I see. I see. Well, so you're thinking that the, as it were, the final, um, the final step is one that she would take. And I mean, the final step is just modus ponens. So that's been going from the conditional to the, or the generalization. Actually, it's generalization to, uh, to. Um, so the, yeah. The, the, so the final, the final step uh, of the inference from, you know, if the sky is red in the evening and some, something bad will happen to me soon, to, uh, and the sky is red in the evening, uh, so something will, will happen to me uh, soon. Um, that final step um, is, is fine. Um, but, but of course, uh, I mean, they themselves are not, are not criticizing the, the belief that something bad will happen to her soon in terms of, uh, uh, in relation to the final step, which which they would also be, of course, be perfectly happy with, they're criticizing it uh, in relation to the 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 status of of the beliefs um, that it comes from, and um, and it, it's because one of them has a a, a, a bad uh, status that they're critical of it, and uh, and the point is that that. that that same criticism is open to me because the um, the reason that Brianna uh, has this, uh, as it were, the major premise, which you know, the, the, as a belief that that if there's a red sky, then something bad will happen to her soon. That that has to do not with her disposition to um, to be a good cognizer in whatever sense is required, but just to do with the fact that she's brainwashed. Um, I think I'm, I think what I will, uh, by the way, I, one thing I didn't ask you, do, do we not normally take a break or do we, or it's getting a bit late. To, yeah. Okay. I think, I think this time it's got a bit late to take a break, but, uh, but maybe, maybe, um, with future ones. Okay. Yes. Um, 
well, uh, let's see. I'll, uh, let me try to, to, to wind, wind up quite um, quickly, and, and, then we, and then we'll decide what to, to do. Um, so, uh, something that, that, that I'll, I'll mention, uh, yeah, a couple, uh, sorry, a couple of things. Uh, w w one is that, uh, ab about the way they argue in this paper, um, I think the view of the authors of this paper is that, that we can get the, the right verdicts on these cases um, by, by focusing on the methods of belief formation that these people are, are using and, um, and whether they are, are generally good ones uh, or not. Um, and and so the the idea is that that Brianna has a has a bad method of forming beliefs about whether something bad will happen to her, um, and um, or if you like, there the, the was a bad a bad method, I mean, the brainwashing. Um, uh, whereas Ned is in the the brain in a vat is is using good methods because he's using the same methods that he had before he was put in the vat and he's supposed to be you know generally a good uh, cognizer. Um, I I think that if one th if one tries to think in terms of methods, um, it's not at all obvious that those are the right uh, classifications. I mean, of course, there's a notorious issue about the individuation. Of methods, I mean the the known as the generality uh, problem, but you know if, if we were t if we were talking about, I mean, the particular belief that they ha have in relation w to the brain in a vat is just the belief that it that it's sunny, and you know what's an I mean, I, and let's assume that in the good case, Ned f forms the belief that it's sunny just by by looking out and seeing that it's sunny. Uh, so, I mean, it seems that the natural description of the method that he's using uh, is something about his vision that you, he's using he's using vision to determine that it's uh, sunny outside but the brain in a vat doesn't use vision at all it's it's got no eyes it's uh, um, so uh, it, it can't form any beliefs by by vision um, and I mean of course it it's using a, a method which it can't distinguish from vision, but um, but the fact that that you can't you can't distinguish between two methods doesn't mean that they're the same. And so you know the, the idea that the methods are the same across the two cases seems to me utterly uh, problematic. Um, so you know. I, I, you know, I don't think one's going to get m much of an explanation f from appealing to uh, to methods because methods are uh, I mean, the individuation of methods is so it's so problematic. Um, so that was, I mean, w just wanted to to bring out that point. And then finally, um, just to say something about the alternative kind of. Um, Normative structure that um, that they want to uh, substitute for the the one that I'm offering, um, which is partly based on a distinction between what they call following Conor McHugh uh, evaluative and prescriptive uh, norms, and the, where the evaluative norms are meant to be the kind that you would naturally articulate. Um, Using the word "good," that uh, a good belief or um, a good action or or whatever, whereas the prescriptive ones, they say, are, are um, ones that you more naturally articulate using the word "ought," the what what you ought to do. Although that slightly confusingly, they then also talk about the evaluative norms as. Uh, in terms of ought, but but they call, say that these are ought to bees rather than ought uh, to dos. Um, 
And they, in talking about these prescriptions, they say a lot about the idea that these are prescriptions which are actually meant to have some kind of effect um, on the agents involved. You see, for example, they say a key function of prescriptive norms is precisely to reinforce certain norms of conduct by permitting them. So uh, uh, this reinforcing is something that's meant to go on by, you know, presumably by the articulation and dissemination of the, the norm. Um, and then the, 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 fi the sort of picture they, that they have is that we've got two levels of norms. There's the sort of maybe the ultimate uh, one is the evaluative one, which are other things are directed to. But um, and the evaluative, and, and they're quite happy with the idea that, it, in particular, that knowledge might be the ultimate sort of evaluative norm in epistemology. But then the prescriptive norm is something more like an injunction uh, as to what to do that is sort of directed at agents and will guide them to in the uh, the direction of the uh, of satisfying the evaluative norm, but may not take them all the way. I mean, they may, might meet the uh, the prescriptive norm, but but still not achieve the evaluative uh, norm. Um, and and then they uh, they think of justification as uh, at the second level. That justification would be at the level of the prescriptive norm uh, rather than the uh, uh, evaluative one. And so if the evaluative one is knowledge, then the idea is justification takes you in the direction of knowledge, but, but it might not take you all, all the way. And that's supposed to allow for the, the brain in a vat to have justification without having knowledge, and, and in particular to have justified uh, false uh, beliefs. Um, I, for reasons that I've already indicated, I, I find this playing up of prescriptive norms in uh, epistemology not very appropriate because um, both so much of epistemology in fact concerns things that, that we have in common with, um, well, with very small children and, uh, and with um, non-human animals, uh, where the, the idea of you know, a prescriptive norm um, directed at cats and dogs is, you know, is obviously laughable. Um, I mean, you, you, know, you, can't, you can't lecture a cat or a dog on, on how it ought to be forming its beliefs. But it's also the case that the room for lecturing human beings on how they ought to be forming their beliefs is somewhat limited. Um, I mean, there's, there's not very much that, I mean, there's a bit, but there's, uh, but there's only a rather limited amount that, that you can do in lecturing people, for example, on how they ought to form uh, perceptual uh, beliefs. I mean, most of the time, they, they're just going to go ahead and form them. There isn't very much that, that you can do about it. Um, and, and so it, it, seems, it seems to me that quite inappropriate to have a prescriptive norm in their sense as really central to epistemology. Um, because th that, in effect, makes epistemology uh, irrelevant to, to most of the, the knowers that, that there are, at least uh, on this uh, planet. Um, and of course, I mean, there, 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 as well, the the idea of, of epistemology as a uh, prescriptive discipline, which actually uh, issues us with with guidance that we can really follow and that will be uh, useful to us. I mean, that's um, I, I mean, th there may be some role for epistemology of that kind, but I think um, m most of um, epistemology is directed at um, understanding the world rather than changing it. Um, and that when, when we're concerned with issues about, like the case of skeptical scenarios and 
uh, and so on. Um, that the great bulk of the issues that um, such, such scenarios present, um, including their, um, their skeptical, I mean, the, the, the skeptical arguments associated with them, does not depend on anything about human beings' ability to, to control their own beliefs by, as it were, conscious uh, reform, but just depends on much more basic features of our, our uh, cognitive uh, apparatus. Uh, and I think, it, it, actually, in, in a number of ways, focusing on, on non-human animals, I mean, it might seem a little bit quaint, but I think it's actually quite a good uh, corrective to over-intellectualizing tendencies in, in epistemology. And w w just one very simple one is that you know, w when one's thinking about, um, about problems of skepticism, um, it's, it's a sort of natural th thought that our resistance to skepticism might be a kind of um, it, it might involve some kind of narcissism and, you know, a, and a, as it were, un unwillingness uh, to be to be humbled, and that as it were, if only we were, you know, a bit uh, a bit less uh, proud of ourselves, then perhaps we, you know, the picture might be well. Then we maybe then we could accept some of the skeptics' uh, lessons, and. You know, I think quite a good test of that sort of question about, about whether, as were, if you like, it's human pride which is making us uh, resist the, the skeptics' arguments, is just to think, well, w what do we think about non-human non animals um, and their knowledge? Do, do, we, do we think that, of course, cats, Cats and dogs don't really know anything at all because of skeptical scenarios. And in that case, where, where our own pride is not at all at stake, um, and uh, you know, where we, well, of course, we may be a bit of a cat lover or whatever, but, but where, as it were, it shouldn't be vanity that's preventing us from seeing the truth about what animals can know. In that case, it seems actually kind of obvious that um, that non-human animals know a lot about their own environments and so on. And, um, and there seems to be something that's hard to take seriously about skeptical arguments uh, as directed at them. And so it, it, it's a kind of reminder that there might be something utterly implausible about skepticism that does not depend on human vanity. Okay, uh, so that's, uh, we can now, well, What's the general feeling? Should we have? I'm, I'm happy to either to go directly into discussion or to t take a break and then have some discussion. Which, which, okay, we may have five minutes break. Okay, let's 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 have five minutes break and and and, and then we can have discussion. We have a long presentation, yes. So I mean, it was long partly because of the, the questions, but I think the, the questions really helped to, to, to break it up. And, and so I'm... I'm Because my uh, objection is uh, they are not comparable. I mean, it's sunny, is something which can be true or false, uh, and the problem is that I am not in the condition of knowing what's going on. So I have perhaps to believe something which I cannot uh, know as something evident to me. So my approach to truth is of the kind of belief and not of knowledge. While in the second two other cases, it's not a matter of what is true or not. What uh, will be, uh, what will happen, 
which uh, would be the wisest decision or the best decision, something which concerns the future and is not at the time being a matter of truth or, or falsehood. It's a matter of prevision, of foreseeing, of um, ability, of orientating myself about something which is not uh, in my possible knowledge. So um, I would like to understand whether I treated all these falsely on my behalf as beliefs, uh, and then uh, I follow completely the um, general framework about uh, an over-intellectualizing epistemology, um, an, an unwillingness to be humble, and so on and so on. But uh, my concern is about beliefs and the possible uh, covering of these uh, different cases under the same umbrella of rational belief. Thanks. Yeah. So, of course, this, I mean, these examples are from the, the Simeon, Kelp, and Giesen, and um, so it's just partly a matter of how they're understanding these examples. But I, I think that, that they're uh, uh, assuming that um, beliefs about the, uh, that, that, that the future is something that we can have beliefs about in advance. And, and I think they're probably assuming that these beliefs, in fact, I'm pretty sure they are, that they're assuming these beliefs can be true or false in advance. Although, of, of course, it, it's not always e easy to know wh uh, which. Um, and, and I mean, it seems, the thing is, of course, there are, there are views of the metaphysics of time on which the future is something like the, the realm of the possible rather than the actual. And, and if you think about it that way, then that casts a very different light on um, you know, what it takes for a belief about the future to be true. But, but, but from the point of view of whether it is a belief, that might have to do more with the the way that the believer thinks about the future than than with what the true metaphysical theory of the future is, and um, and so the um, you know it it may be that that both Brianna and and Ben are, are thinking about the, the the future as something which you know as perhaps is even. Are already determined, or I mean, it wouldn't have to be as strong as that, but they could be thinking about it like that in such a way that that it makes perfectly good sense to 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 have beliefs about it now, and for those beliefs to be um, to be true or, uh, or or false. And you know, I mean, after all, uh, um, the you know, I mean, it 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 does. Um, I mean, I mean, having beliefs about the future seems quite, quite a normal thing to to do. I mean, you know, it's it's, it's a, you know n normal to uh, to think that um, that that you know the sun will will rise tomorrow and 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 so on. And um, and as for the belief about the. Um, that it's sunny. That, I mean, that's yeah. That's that's just meant to be a, a straightforward. Well, it's it's meant to be in principle a straightforward perceptual belief. Although, of course, in in Ned's case, he's that not actually capable of having perception. But it. But he believes it because he thinks, or at least uh, he he wouldn't believe it if he realised that he he wasn't uh, having uh, perception. So that so these are meant these are meant to be. Beliefs in a fairly full-blooded sense of the the term, um, but I think I think that um, it, if you do, if you don't like that aspect of their examples, I think you, it would be possible to to change um, to change the examples because you could have you could have uh, um, Brianna having a belief, um, a, you know. The, that it connects the, the evening sky being red with, you know, that five five minutes ago something bad happened to to someone she loves or something like like that. And um, and in 
in the benighted cognizer case, you could have Ben, you know, going through similar rituals, you know, in order to find out, um, you, you know, why um, why his crops were were failing or something like like that. So, I, so I don't think the the fact that these are future oriented is essential to the structure of the examples. I have a worry about uh, about Brianna and factivity. Uh, it, it's related to something uh, people asked before, uh, but I was so if you so in your account, Brianna fails K because she believes something she doesn't know. Yes. But then, if we look at um, O D K, uh, and we say, okay, so. She, and, and you, you claim she, compli she complies with uh, ODK, she, so she does what a knower would do with respect to a certain um, belief. But the thing is, if knowledge is factive, I was wondering, is the notion of being a knower also factive? Because if it is, then... Yeah. No, if it is, if 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 by being factive you mean that that a knower is somebody who all of whose beliefs are true or something like that, then then obviously that yeah. that that uh, that's too strong. So the so the idea is that being a, being a knower is having a disposition to believe only when you know. But 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 that dispositions are are not hundred percent matters. You know, and um, and so this is this is a point from the literature on dispositions. So that, um, you know, for example, if you think of fragility as a disposition to break when struck, then um, the, you know, something can be, something can be fragile, but, but if, if you sort of wrap it very carefully, then it won't break when it's struck. Um, but wrapping it very carefully doesn't make it less fragile. I mean, that's the way in which, the, the, as it were, we think of dispositions as somewhat internal. I mean, that, that, that you know, if, 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 in wrapping it, you're not changing its molecular structure or anything like that. And so uh, it, it remains equally fragile. And so the, so the idea is it, that although uh, a knower is somebody with a disposition to believe only when they know, that, that doesn't guarantee that they will always only believe when they know. It just, uh, they just have a tendency that, that way. But there are various things that can block the, the tendency, and so, which is happening to Brianna in this, in this case. Trick to make, uh, to, to draw this difference between knowledge and being a knower is like moving to, changing the scope of the only. It's not that you only believe what you know, but you're disposed to only believe what you do. Yeah. So yes, I mean, so it's yeah. So the the, oh. the, the as it were, the, if you like, the, the non. The, I mean, the fallible part is coming from the disposed. So it's it's you're disposed that you know. If you believe p. For you know, for any old p, then then you know p, um, and. So the 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 k part is is just as uh, factive as ever, but the but the disposed being disposed to do something. Doesn't doesn't mean that um, that you will do it on on every occasion. I mean, if you know, if 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 someone is you know a teetotaler is de disposed not to drink alcohol, but if you slip some alcohol into their water, then then they may drink some <laughs> some alcohol. So. Thank you for your talk. Um, I was wondering whether the distinction between um, justification and excuses can be extended to the Getia cases. Um, after all, in the case, uh, cases described by Getia, uh, the epistemic agent has a true belief which is based on or inferred by a false belief. Yes. And so, um, one might argue, it is not obvious at all that uh, um, she has a proper justification. Maybe she has just an excuse. What, what do you think about a, such a strategy? Well, that, I mean, that's, that's in a way what I'm, I'm proposing. Um, and, and so, um, you know, I, think, 
I think it's just not obvious in advance whether to, to call the, 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 um, the victim of the, the, the Gettier cases, whether to call their beliefs justified or not. And, and certainly what, what one experience that I've had on, I think, several occasions is uh, when explaining Gettier cases to people who are, n who are not philosophers, um, that you know, if if you were thinking of the X Phi literature, you'd think that that all the, the all the issue would be about whether the the person knows or not. But often, what the, the non philosophers are objecting to is this isn't a properly justified belief. And and so um, you know, I th I think what's what's happened is that it's it's you know it's be become kind of built into the way epistemologists or analytic epistemologists think about these cases that they're not, they're not supposed to, that they are supposed to be cases of justification and. Uh, and that's to some extent, I mean, it, it, well, a, an interesting feature of, of Gettier's original paper is that the, um, I think it's, that he, it's he who, who's introducing the term justification. I mean, the, the people that he's talking about are uh, Eyre and Chisholm. And Eyre, just, he doesn't talk about justified, he talks about having a right to be sure. And... Um, I, 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 offhand, I can't remember what, what Chisholm says, but I don't think it, I mean, I, as far as I remember, it's not using the word justified. I, I, um, and, and so, so it's kind of Gettier who's, uh, um, who's kind of laid down the ground rules because he says very explicitly in his paper that he's taking it that, that you can be justified in having a false uh, belief. And I think that um, it's certainly the case that, that, that epistemologists w went along very easily with, with, with that stipulation of, of Gettys. But, but I, I agree that um, it's, it, it's, not, it's not at all obvious. And uh, yeah, and it, I, I mean, I, and my own pref I mean, view is that the right norm is a knowledge norm, and therefore that, that the Gettier um, subjects don't uh, have justification. And, and I would say that even in the cases like the the fake Barnes case, where, or, or and certain other cases where it may be that the um, you have. I mean, there, may, there are some examples of perceptual Getty cases where it seems that pr the most plausible view is that the subject does not, in fact, have any false beliefs about the situation. They, they because they're not they're not kind of there are things going on that they're not aware of, but they're not thinking that those things are not going on because the question has never occurred to them. And in those cases too, I want to say that they lack justification because they lack knowledge. But, uh, but I mean, that's, that is going beyond what I was positively arguing in this, in this talk. Thank you. Um, hi, thanks. So I think I wanted to ask you something about rationality. Um, I'm not, I'm not entirely clear on the question uh, in what sense, if any, rationality is, is normative uh, on, on the picture that, that you are yeah. proposing. Um, maybe maybe the, the easiest way to, to explain this is, is as follows. So suppose um, that, um, as you seem to, um, to say, um, a, a, key no a knowledge norm for belief is the, is the primary norm. And then you get um, you have some secondary norm, um, which plays, well, and then you have rationality as um, in the in the role of secondary norms, yeah. so to speak. Okay. So um, now suppose um, uh, take the the classic um, uh, brain in a vat case. Um, so obviously, if I have to respect um, the K norm, uh, I'm not. I ought not to believe that um, things are a certain way. Uh, but at the same time, um, so suppose I, um, I believe, I, I'm a brain in a vat, it seems to me that there's a chair in front of me, I believe that there's a chair. It seems that I am satisfying some norms, such as the tertiary norm, do what a knower would do. Uh, but maybe it depends on how one reads the counterfactual, but uh, it seems to me a plausible reading would be something like, do what a person who... Um, uh, who, in ordinary circumstances, is a knower, would do if she were in these circumstances. If she were to yes. be invented, right? So, 
and it seems clearly she, she would believe that things yes. are that way. So, um, so it seems that the K-norm and the tertiary norm are issuing uh, conflicting requirements because one says uh, that I should not believe that there's a chair and the other says that I should believe that there's a chair. So I was wondering, is it the case that it's, it's okay to violate the tertiary norm? Uh, So yeah, 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 basically, if, if the two norms yeah. issue incompatible requirements, what, 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 one, what should one do? Well, so, I mean, I think, you know, the, the, the primary norm, in a way, is the, is the one that counts because it's the, um, in, you know, it, it, it's responsible for all these other things. But, but in, the, in the circumstances, um, the, I mean, the only the only way of um, I mean, a, a further, there's a further complication here, which is that often that the, the, there is more than one way of complying with these norms, and um, the so in fact the, the only person um, who's uh, who's going to manage to comply with the the K norm in the circumstances of a brain in a vat is is going to be some skeptic, you know, who who just suspends belief about everything. And of course, that I mean, the, it, it, when we're dealing with norms which just say believe only, and so, I mean, which as well, which sometimes um, I mean, permissive rather than mm -hmm. uh, mandatory norms of, on belief. Uh, I mean, you always satisfy those just by by suspending belief. But, and um, and so, in order to say what's bad about the the skeptics policy, we we, we actually, I, in my view, we need we need some kind of uh, some uh, further uh, a further injection from somewhere else, you know, about the value of knowledge or something like like that, which I don't, in fact, want to to ground in quite in the same way as just the, uh, the permissive norm on, uh, on belief. But um, I'll be talking about a bit more about that uh, t tomorrow. But um, so uh, so the thing is, the person who does best in the, the, the brain in a vat scenario is a skeptic, is who's the one who does extremely badly um, in, in normal circumstances because they're totally ignorant. Um, and so that, I mean, you know, one can say, well, look, the, 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 the primary norm, it, you know, is the one that, that matters uh, most. But, but in a lot of these situations, I, I think in a way, the, the only adequate description of it. it is, it's quite a nuanced one, which just says, look, here, here, are, the, here are the good aspects and the bad aspects of, of going a certain, a certain way. And, um, but, but, you know, in many of these cases, it's, it, as well, this is not something that we have much control over anyway. So, um, that, and, and by the way, I mean, you, and you get you get these kind of situations with 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 very ordinary norms as well. I mean, so that uh, you know, in the um, you know, in the case of a, a, a norm of obeying the law, um, you know, in situations where there's there's some kind of mix up about about you know whose which bag belongs to which person or whatever the kind of cases I was talking about before, then it's going to be the law-abiding person. Who breaks the law and and the criminal who uh, complies with the law simply because of of the uh, epistemic <laughs> circumstances that, that um, and you know so so that I mean, you know one can one can ask for a kind of an all considered all things considered verdict but um, the. But uh, I mean, there are just going to be these, you know, a bunch of different questions. Like, you know, what's what's the right thing to do? What does somebody's evidence indicate is the right thing to do, and uh, and so on. And 
you know, and, the, and these are off, I mean, these things often pull in different directions, and, uh, and you know, we just have to accept that that life is complicated. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Um, uh, can I have both a follow up and a question? Okay. <laughs> Uh, I have a follow-up on the Gettier question before. Uh, so if you take the second example on your list, the one about uh, the evidence respecter. Oh, yes. It actually does seem that uh, the subject in uh, the characters in, in Gettier's examples are perfect uh, evidence respecter and they actually do comply with all norms. So I was wondering, even with the norm E, I mean, the evidence is, I mean, it's probably not, uh, it's not the final evidence, it's not, um, how do you say, um, conclusive. Yeah. Uh, however, uh, Smith uh, does respect his evidence and he's disposed to respect his evidence and do whatever an evidence respecter would do and he does that because he is an evidence respecter. So in that sense, at least as far as evidence this, this case is concerned, <coughs> the subject, the Gettier subject, um, does respect yes. old norms. I guess, so, so I guess you're, I was wondering whether your uh, distinction from, the, your, your taking distance from this is that according to you, evidence is not concerned necessarily with knowledge and so it can respect evidence and be an evidence respecter, but that doesn't imply that he has knowledge. Well, according to me, your evidence is your knowledge. Yeah, of course, yeah, <laughs> um, evidence, sorry, but, the internal is. Um, but, so I, I was leaving the, the evidence norm uh, underspecified deliberately. So, so there's a question about what it takes for your evidence to support it. And, you know, in, so in a way, I can make sense of the evidence norm, you know, as just a rewording of the knowledge norm, but, but by taking support to mean conclusive support. Um, but I think most people who who think that the the primary thing is is evidence don't want to go for something as demanding as that. So that so that they're thinking that that some level of evidential support that's less than. Uh, as one uh, in probabilistic terms uh, is uh, is sufficient and uh, and so I think I mean you're you're right um, that it, in those people's eyes the the evidence cases that, I mean they, they seem to come they do comply I think with with all of these uh, norms um, and um, and so I mean so one thing that that just brings out is that that it's not easy for them to explain why why we think there's something ipso facto bad about a false belief because a false <laughs> Um, a false belief, um, you know, as in the, the premise of the Gettier reasoning. I mean, a false belief can can satisfy all, all of these these criteria. And so, one thing one thing that I like about the um, the knowledge norm is that it includes it, it does explain both what's bad about false beliefs and what's bad about beliefs that are sort of of evidence. <laughs> Can you just pick up? Ah, oh, okay, it starts again. Um, but but then uh, those, who, yeah, that was the follow-up. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> now that's the main question. Right. Um, yeah. Sorry. Uh, a follow-up on the follow-up. Those who have this conception of evidence, then of course they might have a problem on your at your eyes to distinguish between false. What is good about true beliefs and bad about false beliefs, but would be totally in agreement with the analysis of the, um, of being justified, being equal in the skeptical and non-skeptical scenario. Um, 
Yeah, so, so people, well, people with an internalist conception of evidence will think that, that the evidence is the same between the good and bad cases. And, and so that, and if justification is determined by evidence, then the justification will also be the same between the two cases. Okay. So, uh, can I, or, or uh, sorry, I, I, uh, there was a, just a clarification. Did you quite get the point about the distinction uh, between uh, evaluative and prescriptive, prescriptive uh, that you, uh, um, that you uh, put forward at the end? So I, I, I understood that there is, that you don't believe the distinction between evaluative and prescriptive um, is any good to um, a proper analysis of norms in epistemology. Yeah. However, uh, it's in, if, I, if one looks at the, at, the, at the norms above, the knowledge and then the, the secondary, the tertiary and the, and the hybrid one, there seems to be a sort of a distinction uh, between the first and the other three, so that the other three may correctly or plausibly be um, expressed in terms of ought to sentences. Uh, they could, well, they, they could so all, be, all be expressed in terms of ought sentences. Right. Also the first, also the knowledge one. Yeah, I mean, I've, I mean, I've put them, the thing is, I put them in this imperative form just because it was a, a kind of short, you know, right. um, snappy way of, of, of putting them. But, but, uh, but really, I th you know, I think a more formal <laughs> representation of them would, would, would put them with something like, like oughts and, and that that could be, um, <laughs> that could be done in every case. Okay, so you think that all of these could be uh, could be uh, expressing all to do, but they wouldn't count as prescriptive. Well, so I mean, they could. I mean, I'm not sure that they would all be ought to do because um, be law abiding. I mean, that's you know have a certain disposition. I mean, that that's not just a, that's a, a being more than a do, yeah a doing. Although I mean, it may be something that that is under a. Uh, control. I mean, so, so uh, yeah. I, in a way, it, it was a bit misleading of me to put to put them all in this imperative form um, when I'm also saying that I don't think that uh, really we're we're concerned with prescriptive norms in the sense of um, norms which are being articulated in order to have an effect an effect on the um, the people who are supposed to be, or the ag the agents or whatever they are that are supposed to be um, governed by these norms um, so although, although I'm putting them as imperatives I'm not I'm not actually thinking that um, that the role of an epistemologist is is to tell people you know what, what they ought to ought to be doing cognitively but because you know, I think we're concerned at a level of abstract theory okay. where, where, um, where the, there isn't that much impact on, on the way people actually think. Um, and so it, it was, the, it was the, this idea of the prescriptive oughts as, you know, as kind of actually things which were meant to have an effect on the people that they're directing, that, that, who are meant to be governed by them. I think that's that's the that's the wrong um, kind of focus for um, for se central epistemological norms. Okay, thanks for the clarification. Oh, thank you. Uh, I wanted to go back to rationality, um, and because. Uh, let me try to say what I believe rationality is, or at least what is crucial for rationality. Uh, I would say that what makes a, a, a certain being rational is the ability to have a high order attitude towards his first order attitude. 
For example, I can be aware of being uh, under an illusion of some uh, sort uh, and don't believe what I see, or I may have a critical attitude toward what I take for granted. For example, I make a connection between a certain uh, uh, color of the sky and mm. a certain kind of event, and then I can have a critical attitude toward that. Uh, so, what, in my opinion, looking at the examples uh, you mentioned, Ned, the brain in a vet person, has all the critical attitude we can adopt, uh, he can adopt. We cannot see that he loses any of his critical attitude. Yeah. While uh, Brianna and Ben, uh, for different reasons, seems to lose their critical attitudes. And for that reason, in my opinion, they, they lose the ras rationality. They are not completely rational. They can be excused for that, for many reasons, but they are not completely rational. Uh, and this seems to me to be a crucial difference, and I would like to see yeah. uh, your, because you don't seem to be, because to make such a strong, to give such a strong importance to rationality is to make a difference uh, uh, even in responsibility, yeah. which is, I believe quite crucial for an internalist, let's say. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, one thing is, I mean, I certainly agree that, that Brianna and, and Ben are not perfectly rational. I mean, I... I mean, I take it that no human being is, is even close to being perfectly r rational. Um, and there, I mean, a lot of what they're doing it, it, is really just, well, in, in, in Ben's case, he's, um, he's accepting a lot of testimony. I mean, presumably he's been told that this is the, the way to do things. And he's been told that by the people who are you know, accepted as experts in his community. Um, and so uh, you know, I think the way the example is intended, and, you know, and it's not so implausible in this light, is that it, Ben's attitude to the people who are telling him this about how to decide when to, to sow his crop is, is not very different from our attitude to scientists who, you know, that, that we, we defer to the scientists on scientific matters, you know, and, um, and if, if, you know, we, we, we might, you know, just... I mean, you know, we defer to doctors, and I mean, doc doctors tell us what we need to do for our illnesses, and um, we, I mean, we have a general impression that they're they're basing what they say on evidence, but typically without knowing what the evidence is. But I mean, Ben may have a general impression that 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 these, you know, the local witch doctor or whoever it is is, is also basing you know, the, the advice about uh, when to to sow your crops um, on. You know, the, 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 on on evidence, and you know, and and from a practical point of view, it's 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 hard for for people to do much better than that. Um, I mean, so that for example, you know, when I when I you know listen to scientists saying something, you know, about global warming or whatever it is, I, I mean, I you know, I, I don't know exactly what their evidence is. I um, you know, and I'm not, even if I were to look at the relevant scientific papers, I wouldn't be in a good position to, you know, to assess uh, uh, how, 
robust their methodology w was. And so, um, so a lot of the time we have to go, you know, on things like social indicators, you know, is this a professor at Harvard University or a professor at Bob Jones University? And, you know, and, and makes a difference. So that, you know, I don't think that, that Ben is, is actually very alien from us. I mean, he's, um, and, you know, I mean, he, he, I mean, of course, we, you know, we have some evidence that scientists know what they're talking about, but, but, but it may seem to Ben that that he, you know, that, that after all, his community has survived for uh, you know uh, hundreds of years, and and you know it survived on the uh, you know often by going along with what the let, let's say the witch doctors you know do, tell them to to do, and and so it would be pretty risky you know to to try to to try anything else. Um, I mean, in Brianna's. Case of course, it, yes. We, I mean, we haven't been told very much about, as were her phenomenology, about, about how this this belief strikes her. But um, it's. I mean, of course, it could seem to her that she's she's been told it, told it by an oracle or something like that. But it could also just be that it's it strikes her as as something obvious. And uh, although she doesn't question it. I mean, I mean, the extent to which we can question our own beliefs is fairly limited. I mean, we, you know, we can do some of that, but we can't, we can't just suspend all our beliefs and then decide from, you know, from zero which ones deserve acceptance. Because we, if we suspend all our beliefs, we, we've got nothing with which to reason as to what beliefs we should have. And so we, you know, we, we, have, to, we have to take a lot for, for granted um, so that... You know, I'd, I don't think we should regard them as being that alien to, to us. No, I, I don't think that they are alien. What I was trying to say is that uh, they are making a mistake such that if they were really working on it, they could recover or somehow find it out. They probably, obviously, as you can uh, to say, that you cannot yes. do that. Yes. That's that's something that they can do if they I'm not sure that it is. I mean, how, how do, I mean, supposing that, for example, Ben wanted to question this belief. Uh, I mean, he could try, he could try doing something different from what, what tradition said he should do. Um, but, you know, he he might try and and be unlucky, and <laughs> you know, I mean, who's to say that 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 in in practice, when if he, I mean, he's not going to try it. I mean, you know, maybe he'll die of starvation or something if his crops don't grow. So, he, I mean, he's maybe he's only got a year or two to try it, in and and that then the, the experiment might easily tell in favour of the the traditional way of doing things. So that you know, there's it's quite limited what he can what he can do. Yes. I mean, he, 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 he could, although it might also be part of the law that if, if, the, that if you don't go along with this process, then the results will be devastating. And the, so that even an experiment would be regarded as, uh, you know, a disrespect of, of the gods. I mean, the Aztecs were in a situation like this because they were, they, I mean, they were conducting these, you know, human sacrifice on a vast scale, but they thought that the, I don't know, that the, the world would end or so if they didn't, didn't do this, the, the, these massive human sacrifices. And, you know, so they didn't, they didn't want to experiment with not doing human sacrifice to see what happened because they, because they thought that 
probably the world would end if, or something like that if, if they didn't do the human sacrifice. So, so I mean, it can be... Re I mean, I agree that there are th often there are things people can do, but, it, but it's... Uh, but, I mean, one can be very, very boxed in in, in a, a, a kind of non-crazy way by, uh, by, a, by a whole lot of self-support, mutually supporting traditional beliefs. Oh, well, thank you for your talk. I have a, just a clarification question because I'm afraid I, I was thinking about what you were saying before and I missed what you were saying about animal beliefs. Yeah. Um, what was your point about animal beliefs uh, with respect to epistemology? I mean, animals do have beliefs as we do. Yes. And uh, what does this tell about any epistemological project? Uh, can well, you just... So, uh, Say, so I on the one that yeah, part. Yeah. So I mean, I think, but I well, I think I, I was actually using animal belief and, and animal knowledge for, for in several different ways. But so, but partly I was using it, you know, as a case where, um, and I take it that a, that a lot of animal, I mean, perceptual knowledge is not drastically different from human perceptual knowledge, and that, and so that. And that animals can also be, I mean, human, non-human animals can be victims of skeptical scenarios and so on. And so that um, the aspects of epistemology, I mean, it seems to me a lot of epistemology should be done in a way that where it makes, would in principle make sense for animals as well as, I mean, non-human animals as well as for, for us, because uh, as many of the issues already arise. But, Yes. Um, yes, because it, well, but, so the. I see. Yes. So, the, so one of the aspects of the way that that Simeon and the others are using this. Uh, notion of a prescriptive norm is that it's a norm which is actually intended, which is directed towards certain uh, epistemic subjects uh, so that they are, so that as where it's intended that they will understand the norm and, um, and govern their behavior accordingly. And, and so uh, all, the point that I was making is simply that um, it doesn't make sense, you know, to to have prescriptive norms, you know, for languageless, you I know, mean, for cats and dogs. I mean, because because there's no point in in lecturing cats and dogs on on how they should be forming their beliefs, and that uh, and so that there's an awful lot of epistemology where the where prescriptive norms are are irrelevant because, uh, well, in the case of uh, and. Human and non-human animals bring that out because you know they, they can't uh, understand the norms, and yet the, the, so many of the norms that we're talking about are in fact relevant to to animal uh, beliefs. Um, so that was, uh, and I was also also making it, uh, suggesting that radical skepticism that um, is hard to take seriously when when applied to to non-human. Animals, even though in principle the arguments, you know, are there, but it's so that as where it's, you know, if we just take a case where our own uh, epistemic well-being is not at stake, uh, you know, we're, we're, as where in a sense we can be afford to be more objective about it, we, we're still not. Uh, I mean, it's still, it, it's not that then the uh, skeptical arguments seem overwhelming. It's it's that they actually s seem kind of frivolous. But uh, I think there's a. Sorry, I was a bit hesitant because maybe the question has already been covered, but you know, I will ask you anyway. So this, um, the secondary norm that you have seems to be a norm about a disposition. So be disposed. Yes. And I was wondering, doesn't that sound a little bit odd, like imposing a norm on a disposition, because I mean, like, 
According to some views, at least, it seems that these positions are things that depend on our metaphysical setup. So it, it, they depend on the way we are. Yeah. And so if you're imposing a norm on that, either it's something trivial, because it just seems to say, well, be what you are. <laughs> or otherwise, I don't know if it sort of presupposes a different sort of notion of disposition that is behind the secondary norm. I'm not sure this is really clear, but um, basically it's a question of clarification about you know, this secondary norm and in what sense we can impose a norm about being disposed to do something. Well, it's, again, th these, th these are not, I'm not thinking of these as pres prescriptive norms. So it's not a matter of expecting, you know, telling people what dispositions to have and then expecting them to go off and acquire those dispositions. Although, I mean, you can do some of that, but I mean, I don't think that's very central to epistemology. Um, so, uh, in a way, I'm thinking of these as, uh, you know, in a more evaluative w way. So, it's w what norms it is good to have. Um, I mean, sorry, what, what, what norms it's, what dispositions it's good to have. Um, and, you know, and we definitely do uh, assess people by their cognitive norms. I mean, the, you know, we, um, we talk about rational versus irrational people and um, uh, and th that has to do with what roughly speaking what dispositions that they have for things like belief acquisition um, and you know and that's I mean in evaluating makes makes sense even if people don't have very much control over what dispositions that they have. But, I mean, we do have, I mean, in general, we have some control over our dispositions. I mean, so, for example, um, you know, when, when you learn a, a skill, you, you, you know, you typically, uh, I mean, you don't have to, but you typically you have acquired certain dispositions. Um, and, um, you know, I mean, you, you, you can, I mean, we, we get ourselves into good and bad habits, right? I mean, the, you know, I mean, when people, when people give up smoking, they're, what they're doing is, in large part, is trying to, they're trying to lose a certain disposition, which is hard but not <laughs> impossible. Um, and, you know, and you can also uh, you know, acquire d dispositions. And, you know, and, for example, you know, and education plays some role in that. So that, that, I mean, in relation to what Elisa was doing, I mean, you know, we can, to some extent, teach children to be more critical and questioning. I mean, it's not, I mean, there are limits to how much we can mold children, but, um, but, we, but to some extent that can be done. I mean, you know, what kind of family and school a child goes, you know, experiences will make a difference to how they are in those respects. And it's even something that we can do with ourselves. I mean, for example, you know, one reason why people might decide to study philosophy is because they think in advance that studying philosophy will make them a bit more questioning and they, and they would like to be more questioning. And um, so, you know, it, we have a bit of control, even though it's, you, you can't just simply decide what, what dispositions to, to have. Thanks. Other questions? No, so I have a short follow-up on, on the last question uh, because I was also confused and at some point I thought that uh, there were different notions of dispositions and you were sort of um, um, threading on an ambiguity. Uh, so I can have a disposition to, um, to um, obey the law and that may mean two different things. I mean, one is that I have a natural disposition to do that, which is not under my control, which to some extent seems to be the case of Brianna when she um, lacks the disposition to, be, uh, to believe something only if she knows it because she's been brainwashed, right? I mean, and she can't do anything about that. Uh, and but she might, she might retain the disposition even though um, this is a, a, an exception to the disposition because dispositions are not 100% things. 
So, you know, if, if it's... Mm -hmm. I mean, one understanding of the case is that, that it's just very local brainwashing, so that she's been brainwashed with this, with this one belief. Um, but but most, m most of her cognitive system is, is intact. And in that case, she, she might still have a general disposition to be a knower, even though, uh, she, you know, and, and I mean, I, I think we've actually, you know, most of, we, we have experience of people who are like that. I mean, perhaps m most people are like that, that, that they, they're rational about lots and lots of things, but then there are certain things which, they, which they're completely irrational about, and there's no point in having an argument with them. And so no, okay, but it wasn't, uh, I mean, even if you don't, uh, you think that she has the general disposition. Uh, my point was that it's two different senses of disposition to say that one abides by the law because one has a natural disposition to do that, because it's, one is programmed to do that, and one abides by the law because, um, because you know, he wants to do that, right? But if we could... Yeah, but... Yes. And I might have a disposition to speak a grammatical English in the sense that I want to uh, speak, I only want to utter uh, grammatical English sentences when I, when I, when I try to speak English. But, that, is that sensible? but uh, I mean, the, the wanting is not sufficient for a disposition. I mean, so that. Um, you know, so somebody can can want to, you know, uh, impress, uh, you know, the, the, a whole their whole audience every time they speak or whatever. But 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 wanting it doesn't, you know, make, <laughs> make no, it. No, no. I but yeah. Yes. Yes. But one may do certain things because he is, or she is, um, somehow programmed to do it. Yes. Uh, that thing that has no control over it. And so. But that that doesn't have to be a, an ambiguity in disposition. It can simply be a, two different ways of having a disposition. I mean, there's a, obviously there's a distinction. That uh, you know, in you know, in some cases, the disposition depends, you know, on on a desire, um, but m maybe a deep-rooted desire. Um, whereas in other cases, it, it's just completely independent of, of a desire. But But that, as I said, that, I mean, that's not an, I, that's, that doesn't ha I don't think that's an ambiguity. I think it's just that it, it, it's a particular, I mean, there are all sorts of different bases that a disposition can have. And, and one base can be in, in, in a desire which, uh, you know, is, is then um, act, you know, where, which is also acted on, you know, regularly or whatever. And so you, you can have a a disposition and um, so it you know it, it, it I'm satisfied I, I don't with think it's built answer. into the notion of a, of okay. a disposition uh, how much con con you know whether we have some control over it or not but it, but of course in the case of I mean it, it, I mean if it's just a caprice then it's not then presumably it's not a disposition but um, you know, if it's just something that we do f because we feel like it on a particular occasion, but that, you know, we might s stop at any moment, then, th then that doesn't sound like a, a disposition. But. So, super quick. I was, so, um, at some point you said, in, in replying to Sandra, you said something about 
the locality of this sort of exception. And I think I'm a bit worried about that because um, how are we going to, so if we want to save the notion, the intuitiveness of the notion of this position, we need to, well, have like a story about when um, an exception is local enough. And I guess I, I, I don't see right now a way to do without stakes. So I guess that if a subject is like a perfect knower except mm -hmm. for something concerning, I don't know, um, well, if, you, if we take the case of Brianna, if I have to, uh, if what's at stake right now, it's something about knowing what the red sky means, I'm not going to choose Brianna because, well, she's really bad at those stakes we are at right now. So I'm a bit worried that behind this intuitiveness of being disposed of, of this position, which means, well, if you're perfect except for one thing, it's not the end of, of the world. Ah, there are cases where it is the end of the world. And I, I don't know, like, I, I, do, do you have like some kind of contextualist way out? I'm, I'm, I'm not wanting to connect this with stakes. And, you know, I mean, I mean, my, you know, dispositions, my, my, or can be dispositions of, of pretty much anything, and you know, and th th they're um, so that you know it could be, for example, that um, a you know something has a um, a disposition to as robust in the sense that that it it um, it generally survives being hit but th there might be one minute point as it were a minute achilles heel or something that w w where you know and and then if if you can hit it at the, exactly the right angle on exactly the right spot then it will collapse and so obviously that that detracts a bit from from its robustness but it, but it could still be overall you know a robust object if you know if, if the, the um the, the, what you have to do to it to, to break it, it is sufficiently intricate and un, you know unlikely to uh, to happen. And you know, I mean, these these kind of notions like disposition. I mean, they're they're meant to be rough and ready ways of thinking about the the world that are kind of suitable to a a, a sort of common sense. Uh, cognition, but th they're they're the kind of uh, you know so they're not they're not super precise, um, and you know it, it can. It can, I mean you know and a, a lot it may depend on on whether the um, you know there's there's some regular way in which the, the, these exceptions will be found out. I mean you know in the case of Brianna. Um, it, it may be that um, it's you know it's it's very it's very rare that 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 she, that she sees a red sky or whatever and and, and maybe nobody uh, else knows that she has this weird b belief so that it, it you know it may it may make very very little little difference um, but you know it seems to me that if um, you know, even if it's if it's a very high stakes difference, it, um, you know, so, so that you know, I mean, I, I mean, a ship might a ship might be generally seaworthy, but but there's just some extraordinary combination of of waves and temperature and so on, which will make this ship fall apart. But if you know, which it's very unlikely that a ship would ever meet those, but it, you know, it, it still it might meet those in you know if it's unlucky and then fall apart. And um, but I, the fact that there are disastrous circumstances shouldn't affect the judgment as to you know as to whether um, it, overall it has the disposition or or not. Because I mean, as I say, these these are not these don't have to be sort of act. I mean, th th it's, these are not aimed at immediate practical uh, 
applications that, that they're aimed at kind of understanding in, in this kind of proto-scientific way, you know, what goes on in the world. Uh, I think we should stop here because it's yeah. 10 past 5, so if you have other questions, you can sort of ask them tomorrow. <laughs> and <laughs> so, see you tomorrow. Thank you. Uh, uh, <laughs> and thanks for all the discussion. Yeah. <laughs>